The views and opinions expressed are for general informational purposes only. Consult with your physician or medical health care provider for medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Today, we talk about food culture and our community. How do we eat? This is a bonus show. I'm Dr. Vicki Haywood Doe, and with me is our co-host, Dr. Virginia D. Banks Bright, and our guest, Isaac Floyd of Iconic Body. And we're asking the question, can we eat healthy and still maintain our food culture? What is black food culture? Or what is black culture food? And guess what? Most of the staple foods in our culture are collard greens, kale, yams, black eyed peas, and okra. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's it. We just need to focus more on how it's prepared. Less salt, more herbs and spices. In this show, we give tips on how you can change your mindset and start implementing healthy eating and lifestyle change. All this and more on It's All About Health and Fitness. All right, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Vicki Haywood Doe, and we are doing our podcast. It's all about health and fitness. We're doing it live today. And we have joining us, we have, of course, our co host, Dr. Virginia D. Banks Bright. And hey, Vicki. Hey, hey, and we have a guest, our guest now. He's the he family, right, D? He That's family. True. But we have Isaac Floyd joining us. And Isaac is joining us today from Florida. He's a nutritionist and founder of his company, Iconic Body, LLC. And he will join us today as we talk about an important discussion today. We talk about food, culture, and African Americans. And the questions are, are we choosing foods based on what black folks eat? You know, and we've heard it, you know, we've heard it out there. It's our culture. We got to have some fried chicken and some macaroni and cheese and sweet potato pie. And nothing's wrong with that every now and then. But shouldn't we choose our food based on how it gives us energy and vitality and protect us from chronic diseases? And so, yes, we should do that. And yes, healthy foods can be delicious and tasty. Right, Isaac? <laughs> Absolutely. Liz, we're going to get into some good topics today. I'm with my favorite people talk about my favorite topics. So this is going to go very well. And what do you say, D? You know, I'm we excited. Are- First of all, I'm excited to see Isaac. It's been a minute. So much has happened in his life. I'm so proud of you. That's great. It's Thank really so good to much. see you. I don't know. It's been almost two years, right? It's been a while, saying I don't think I've seen you since um, before I moved. Right before I think I moved. so. I, I moved. think that's right. I know. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's good that we are together today and in good health with all this stuff going on. For real. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. But first, I want to tell everybody out there that's listening to us, make sure you ask questions, give us feedback in the comment section below, Um, give us thumbs up, thumbs up, and share this live podcast on your Facebook page, Twitter, or any of your social uh, media platforms, you know, help us spread awareness of the importance of taking charge, taking charge of your life, you know, being proactive and living a life of health and wellness. And so I want to remind you to go to our health and wellness uh, website, vickidofitness.com, V-I-C-K-I, right? Vickidofitness.com, get engaged, uh, sign up for our programs. Um, make sure you follow us, 
look at all the uh, important information, the videos, the recipes, and, you know, reach out to us for our health and wellness service. And last but not least, make sure you personally commit to a living, a commit to living a life of health and wellness. And guess what, folks? You will be so glad that you did. Now, today, Isaac and Dr. D, we are talking about, you know, food, culture, African-Americans, you know, and why we should, you know, eat healthy and live, live a healthy life. And we know, we know the reasons why based on the research out there, you know, the American Heart Association, NIH, CDC, you know, still reminds us that heart disease is still the number one killer. And we, as African Americans, are at greater risk. So with that said, what do you think? What do you think, Dr. D? We'll start with you first. You know, what about the prevalence in our community? Well, you know, this COVID pandemic has shined a light on how um, bad the situation is. I mean, in terms of, of African Americans and, you know, the comorbid illnesses that you were just that you were just talking about, you know, the hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease and so forth, because these are the people that were most affected in the COVID pandemic. So, um, you know, it's a timely topic. And, you know, unfortunately, it took a virus like COVID to bring this out. But I'm hoping working, moving forward, we'll have more of a focus on this. Right, Isaac? Absolutely. Um, I think you couldn't have said it better myself. Certainly, um, COVID has kind of highlighted this vulnerability, but this vulnerability that has existed, you know, before COVID. Um, and that is that same type of vulnerability that, you know, exposes certain populations to lifestyle illnesses more than other populations. So um, it's definitely some very interesting stuff. And I think um, the outcome, the statistics we know, you know, some of the lifestyle factors we know. So the research poses some kind of aha moments, um, as well as some things that we definitely can reflect about our own culture. So will be a good discussion. Yes, it definitely will be a good discussion. And so, yes, we know that, you know, risk factors uh, for cardiovascular disease, um, especially if we focus on heart healthy eating and all of that, we know for cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, right? That's a risk factor, hypertension. But let's hone in on overweight and obesity and physical inactivity. You know, uh, when we talk about um, these things or these risk factors, we always go back to the precursor for these risk factors or for cardiovascular disease, cancer. And when we get to it, it's overweight and obesity and physical inactivity. And those are the two uh, lifestyle factors that we can kind of control. So what's your thoughts on that, Dr. D? Um, well, you know, I, I hate to keep coming back to COVID, but it's low hanging fruit with what mm -hmm. you're talking about. It just came out, which I have all continued to say based on just anecdotal experience of the patients that I have taken care of over the last year, obesity is emerging as the number one risk factor for patients with COVID, you know, we thought it was going to initially we thought it was going to be people with underlying lung disease and people with, you know, I mean, although they, they they do have the others, but obesity is coming out as number one. And I observed that in my own observation when I started really taking care of these patients in um, uh, last March, I think was my first time. So and from that. If you look at all the other things drop down, yeah, genetics comes in and all of that. But in this country, obesity sort of is like at the top. Like if you remember your anatomy, it's the motor neuron of the nervous system from which everything else branches out this bad. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you fix that, 
a lot of these other things will be fixed. And, you know, we, it's a, it's a, it's a subject that, you know, I've had weight problems and, you know, it's a very, very important topic for me. And it's kind of like, you know, we had, we've had bariatric surgery and we've had, you know, we have all these diets and this, that, and the other, but sometimes I just sit down and throw up my hands and holler because <laughs> we don't seem to be getting any place. What do you think, Isaac? I, I, you raised some very good points and I actually want to ask you, um, what about obesity do you think, you know, increases that risk? And also, um, if you both may, um, you know, expand on that genetic component, because what we learn a lot in the literature and as I teach my classes, we learned that, you know, even though there is a genetic component to things like cancer, you know, heart disease, it often is a very small component where, you know, if it's a pie chart of risk, genetics is this little tiny pie where, activity, you know, diet, lifestyle factors like smoking are the majority, you know, 80 to 90% of that risk. So um, I think a lot of people sometimes can overestimate that genetic. Well, if my parents had, you know, diabetes or obesity or, you know, cancer, breast cancer, then, well, what can I do? I might as well be happy and live my life. And it's like, no, genetics is this very small piece of that risk where what we can control, as Dr. Doe said, is a much larger um, factor. Right. And so um, when we look at the research, yes, genetics. Um, yes, that is um, a, a factor. But guess what? You know how genes are expressed. Right. Um, are influenced by the environment. Right. And so what do we mean by environment? That is stress. We don't we don't talk a lot about stress, but stress can trigger a lot of things to not go right. Uh, with your body, but it can trigger those bad habits of stress eating. And you know, every time we 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 do stress eating, what are we grabbing? Comfort foods that probably got too much salt and fat and sugar and all of that. And so, yeah, even though yes, genetics play a factor, but guess what? What we do, our lifestyle, plays a bigger factor. And according to the American Heart Association and a lot of evidence based research, because we go by research up in here. Right. <laughs> a healthy lifestyle. Right. And diet, exercise, not smoke. We, all, we always got to include that. I don't know why people still are smoking, but, you know, don't smoke, folks. Right. But um, um, healthy diet and lifestyle exercising and all of that, they are the best weapons to fight uh, cardiovascular disease, but um, other chronic diseases as well. So what do you say, Dee? Um, well, these, you know, you, you can't, you can't pick your parents and you can't pick your, your genetics, but I, I often say we can, these are some things that we can do for ourselves, you know, and as a physician, when I used to do, I do mostly hospital work now, but when I was in taking care of patients in the office, you know, it was just amazing all the excuses that people had for, for not doing what they were supposed to do. And then you would, you know, you don't want to chastise anybody, but it just sort of seemed like this is something that you can do for yourself. Um, and, you know, again, this COVID thing is going to bring out a lot of because we've been quarantined for the last year. You know, um, what one of the observations that we are, we're making now is that people have neglected themselves. And so now with the COVID pandemic kind of dying down, what we're seeing is a lot of patients coming in the hospital with things that they should have taken care of three or four months ago. A lot of diabetic infections, a lot of kidney disease that should have been identified early on. And to that end, a lot of people uh, have lost, have gained a lot of weight during this pandemic, you know, not being able to exercise because, you know, it's cold and you can't go outside or gyms. Nobody has wanted to go to a gym, which they, by the way, just said, I just said that the other day, that gyms have apparently been super spreaders. We've talked about that. Mm hmm. Um, that, you know, that they maybe not, you know, I've been trying to do a little bit of lap swimming, but you can call and make an appointment for your own lane. But when you're in this environment with all those treadmills and stuff, I often said that just couldn't be good. Mm -mm. 
Mm-mm. So, yeah, I mean, people have control over some of these things, but it's just it's very difficult to change to change a lifestyle habits is difficult. Don't you guys think? Oh, big time. Yeah. That's why we're still talking about it now. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, right. That's always a hot topic, right? <laughs> it is. I think a, a, it comes into question about, you know, strategies, intervention strategies, educational strategies, because, you know, like you said, and then you shared a very interesting art- article with us, Dr. Doe. And the first thing I saw was the year and that it was, I'm not exactly sure when, but it was at least a decade ago. And like mm-hmm. you said, issues the same, we're talking about the same thing. So um, I was actually speaking to um, a scientist who I've follow Mary Nestle and I asked her, you know, from all her experience, she's 80 years old and she studies, um, you know, food systems, food security, et cetera. Um, and I asked her out of everything she's learned, what question does she still have? What question would she like to see research? And she mentioned um, educational strategies, you know, the different strategies that can get people from point A to point B, because the reality is that the strategies that we're currently using are not working. People are still obese. People are still overweight. So how can you deliver this information in a way that is relevant, in a way that is practical? And what we're talking about today when it comes to cultural foods, you know, instead of telling a, a African-American person to eat, you know, some kale and some yogurt and, you know, certain foods that they may not be familiar with, you know, how can we turn foods that we already like, like collard greens, like okra, you know, um, some of the flavors that we love, and translate them to more um, healthy foods. Okay, so let's talk then. Let's talk about our food culture and and get some of the myths and the fallacies out there. You know, when we go way back, like you said, um, Isaac, it's not it's not about the the being exposed because you know we brought a lot of the the foods that that we eat now. We we brought that with us from. Africa, like the okra and the black eyed peas and the yams and the greens, right, D? Yeah, yams. I was just thinking yams, exactly. Yeah, we brought that. We brought that with us, you know, the rice and and all of that. And yeah, people talk about kale, but we've been eating kale with our collard greens and mustard greens for about three hundred plus years. So we know, we know those foods. It's just how we cook them. I think mm-hmm. is our issue. But we don't have to uh, get rid of the spices. What do you think, guys? Are you the cook up in here? Absolutely. Like you said, spices and flavor is key. You know, we, we, we don't necessarily love the salt and the fat and the sugar as much as we love flavor. We love the experience. And um, the article you shared, it was it emphasized quite a bit how, you know, eating for African-Americans. It's not, you know, even when you compare it to other cultures, we have kind of this heightened sense of community that is around eating. Eating is kind of this um, sacred thing. And, you know, every culture has their their way of breaking bread. But um, for us, it is, you know, very important. So um, the flavor experience, the happiness that comes with it, the community, that's what's important. It's not the fat and the salt, you know, so it's about you remixing that and finding a way to make it work for us instead of working against us as it is in many cases currently. Right. And so um, I like how you, you um, said that, and it's true, you know, and that's for uh, most folks, you know, other ethnic groups and so forth and so on, you know, eating is a social thing. You know, we like to gather with our family and eat, you know, and so when a, a lot of folks, when they're trying to lose weight, they always say, man, OK, so what am I going to do when I go to my family and they see me not eating? They're going to make me feel bad because I'm not eating. But guess what? You know, we can still have that social gathering and eat the foods that we love. We just got to change the way that we we cook our foods and we'll realize, you know, it can taste good without having a lot of salt um, on our greens. Or just know. one thing that we talk about all the time is portion control. You know, you don't have to have, as Vicki and I used to call it, pile high and deep. You know, you go to places and you see, you know, they have these plates, but, you know, you don't have to do that. So portion control can be important. 
Yeah, portion yeah. control is definitely important. <laughs> <laughs> what about when you go to the, the family picnic and the, and this is a real question, you know, this is a real life, something that I've experienced quite frankly. What happens when you are, you know, making that effort and you go and you get called um, a rabbit or your, your cousin says, you know, tells you that you're eating light skin food and oh, that's light skin food. <laughs> What do you do? I never heard of that before. What do you do? That actually, I got that. Y'all you know who who told me that? Food. It was a yin day. A yin day, yes, a yin day. That's what he always says. Yeah, cracking up laughing, even though that was funny, funny. That is kind of a reflection of how we see healthy food. I mean, that's a very yeah. you know um, reflection on how a lot of us see healthy eating. So, what do you guys think about that? What do you ladies think about that? It's like fat shaming, you know, it's eating healthy food shaming. And um, that's why I say, you know, you have to, like I said, when you go to places like that, it, you know, the, to, rather than to stand out, you don't have to have three pieces of chicken. I mean, because one meal is not going to cause you to gain 20 pounds. And to be able to... Um, you remember the, the young man that we had who was uh, Vicky, who was on our show from England, who was talking about drinking and how you can, you know, people don't know, have to know that you're not drinking in ways that you can dis disguise it. And I look at it like this, that one meal is not going to kill you. So rather than having three pieces of chicken, it maybe it's OK to have one. And if you want to enjoy the macaroni and cheese, a tablespoon of mac and cheese isn't going to kill anybody. And that way. You know, you're eating and sharing and fellowshipping without trying to stand out like you're a rabbit or something. Because people will scream on you. I mean, you know. <laughs> and yeah. the ones that are screaming on you are the ones that should be eating that food anyway. But, you know, it's about fellowship. That's it. Absolutely. So so those are some of the ways that you can. But the, the most ideal way is for all of us to, you know, commit to to changing how we eat where, you know, and to know, listen, there, you know, I always, always say, you know, the doctor tells you, he calls, he calls you in and say, listen, you got to give up that bacon, you know, because it's causing you to have, you know, high blood pressure. Now, all the stuff we can eat. Look at all the many stuff we can eat. We are so tuned in on what we can't eat. And if you really think about it, it's a whole bunch of things that we can eat that's tasty other than bacon. So right. I think a lot of it, too, is changing our mindset. You know, Absolutely. it always goes back to changing how we think of things. And so that's why we need to really examine the whole food culture and what that means uh, for African Americans. You know, we talk about soul food, but soul food can be and still can be the good food such as greens, such as yams, you know, yams, man, full of what vitamin fiber. A and, yeah, fiber, you know. And so let's think about how we cook things. Grilled chicken is good. We don't have to be fried. You know what I mean? And so green, more calcium in a, a cup. Exactly. Milk, I mean, tremendously healthy. Tremendously healthy. Yeah. And stream beans. Remember coming from down south. Remember how how my grandmother used to sit and have these big tubs of beans and she would. I uh, still do when I go down there with my mother. I stop at farmer's market, get some string beans and we sit there and string snap, snap yes. beans and stuff. You yes. Know? That's another social thing. That's a social thing. That was a social thing to sit around, not to make it sexist, but the women sitting around and snapping the beans. Yeah, that's a social thing. That's a social thing around healthy eating. And so we can we can do that. And I think I think we give ourselves, you know, we we um, take away the beauty of what we can do and what we've always done with food, you know, in the churches. That's a good, good place to start healthy eating and social, you know, because every time at the church, you going downstairs to eat now half the time what you eaten probably shouldn't but 
you know, that's about mindset. People can change that mindset and start doing um, healthy eating. So let's move on to social economics. Here's something too that we, mm. we talk about. We talk about availability, food deserts, you know, and my thing is, yes, that is a problem, but a lot of times um, how we eat, whether we making bad choices um, of more of the, the, the fat and salt type of food, you know, most of the time, it's not just um, it's not just a social economic thing. What do you think, Isaac? D, I can't see you. Here we go. Here we go. So, what were we saying? The social economic issues and food deserts. You know, a lot of that. Uh, yeah, it's true because of availability. But some of our eating habits that aren't so great probably has nothing to really do with how much money a lot of times. What do you think? I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, anecdotally and then, you know, from our own experiences, we know that, you know, we have friends. I got friends in all socioeconomic status, you know, strata, um, lower class, middle class, upper class, et cetera, doctors, you know, lawyers, you know, and it's very apparent, you know, research shows, but as, as black people, we can say, okay, well, we've seen this and we've witnessed it, but um, we know that for, and to a certain extent, you know, soul food and even some of the unhealthy food is stereotypically associated with our culture, you know, no matter how much money you make, no matter what neighborhood you live in. So it's important that we recognize those stereotypes. And it's also very important that we don't perpetuate them because it's very easy to, you know, impose, even though these stereotypes have been imposed on us for so many generations, it's easy for us to impose it on each other as well. So um, it's important for us to recognize that. And then aside from that, I think, you know, we know this whole woke movement, especially as, as it relates to in general, but healthy eating, it's here. I mean, there are some people on the wave, black people, people of all, you know, um, ethnicities and regions. So it really is about kind of joining that wave and not being caught on that old, those old unhealthy habits. Yes, and I agree too. And so, yeah, so with the social economics and um, um, how much money a person makes, um, food deserts. Yes, that's important. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of it um, with the culture has nothing really to do with how much money you make, right? <laughs> it's just what you've been brought up, what you've been brought up eating. You know, what do you think, D? Yeah, it crosses, it crosses socioeconomic, um, you know, paths. I mean, like you said, you know, you have people who are of means who are eating the wrong food. Um, and, and one other thing I, I wanted to make a point of is that with this lifestyle change, and you were talking about, well, we're eating the foods that we, you have to make a concerted effort. You have to do your due diligence and you have to do your homework to know what foods to eat. I mean, first of all, most doctors don't know how to talk to their patients about nutrition. So it's incumbent upon you if you've decided to make this commitment to start doing lifestyle changes is that you have to make a concerted effort to see what spices you can use. Because if you don't know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, with Dr. Vicki having um, her programs and going out in the community, and it's again, sort of like what we're doing now, trusted messengers. And mm -hmm. I think you too, the trusted messenger, because basically, a lot of folks don't know. I mean, you're in school, you learn science and math and or literature or whatever, but how many of us take a nutrition class in school? I mean, it should, and it really should be started in elementary school. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because the kids are asking their moms, and you know, we were all working moms and you working dad to run by McDonald's and get some chicken nuggets, mm -hmm. you know, and it's that marketing thing that plays on the mind of children to get their parents to do stuff. So, it, those nutrition things need to be started early on so that you grow up with that kind of mindset as opposed to being 50 years old and now it's part of your culture and now you've got diabetes and high blood pressure. And then now you got to change to eat that uh, light skin food. 
<laughs> I never heard that. That was probably my Did favorite. Did you say that with Allende that says that? Yes. yes. And shout out to Allende <laughs> West. Shout, shout out to Allende. Where he is. I think he's <laughs> coming back from Florida, actually. Wow. Yeah, but he always teases us and, you know, but that's what, that's the culture, what people say, you know. Yeah. But, and let me just add as a physician, you know, it, it was just, it was brought up more to me today. I'm, I, other than, you know, now, like I said, we're seeing a lot more things in COVID and we're seeing a lot more people coming in having neglected themselves. You know, I, I work in a long-term care facility now and what we're seeing, we were just talking the other day, obese diabetic men coming in with these significant severe infections in their perineal area. It's called necrotizing fasciitis. It's almost like it's an epidemic mm. and it is associated with, uh, you know, this is a talk show on gangrene and all of that and where the surgeons have to go in when you come into the hospital and you have to have extensive debriding and you're in a hospital for months. And these men are three and four and 500 pounds. Mm. And so we just started to see, you know, diabetes is in epidemic proportions in this country. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you think, Isaac and Vicki? You think, it, I, I think it's one out of 10. Um, I think it's even- What do the statistics say? I think it's, I think it's is actually that, one out of four or three. I think it's- I was gonna say maybe, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. Yeah, I, I think, there, but yeah. I would dash out there and say that too. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're very high and um, statistics also show, recent statistics is that the diagnoses are getting younger. So whereas before this was seen as a 50, 60 year old diagnosis, I actually know people who have been diagnosed with prediabetes in their 20s, sophomores in college that have been diagnosed with pre-diabetes, which as type you guys two. know is the, mm -hmm. yeah, type two diabetes, you know, which is mm -hmm. lifestyle related, diet related, you know, activity related. So certainly is not getting any better as of recent statistics. No, but, it's um, not. And if, um, yes, and I'm gonna have to put that up the, the latest stats. I'm gonna put that in our comment yeah. uh, section when I um, post this, what's the latest stat on type two diabetes, but it's high. It's high there. It's very high. Because, you know, they've continued to lower the number for prediabetes. I mean, what we used to accept as it's okay, you know, uh, over 100 now is kind of like borderline, mm -hmm. you know. So they're, they're lowering the numbers to capture more people mm -hmm. so that hopefully they'll identify themselves as prediabetic, with, I think, with the, for the purpose of starting to make some lifestyle changes. Because diabetes affects every part of your body every vessel every blood it's every the silent time. killer it's the silent killer big time big time and so yeah and guess what all of that can be um um treated or prevented or lessen the 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 dosage of your medication with healthy eating and uh exercise you know Absolutely. it's just doing it it's just doing it Okay, but let's let's talk about another issue right quick. We do, even though we talk about uh, social economic, you know, yeah, yeah, but people are there are folks that can't um, or don't have the availability, food deserts, and all of that for healthy foods. Now, um, some of the grocery stores, I will have to give it to them, um, Giant Eagle. They, tr they try to think of making sure that they um, um, partner with um, farmers, local farmers in the community to put their food in the front, the fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, and um, a lot of the food pantries, because remember the food pantries used to be just um, canned foods and some stuff in the, you know, not a lot of healthy. Now they're trying to be more healthy when they give mm. out um, food to those in need as well. So um, I think collectively as a um, community, uh, the state of Ohio, we're trying to really think about um, having the availability of food to, to folks that um, cannot, well, where the issue is 
availability, these food deserts. There's always initiatives um, being talked about. Uh, what do you think of that? How about you, Isaac? Start out, you know, first on that. What do you think? Do you think we're um, getting the problem solved or we got a long way to go? Right. And that we've seen a lot of good efforts in Ohio. And, and that's a perfect point because it really is, from what I've seen, a regional thing. So certain regions, you know, we have um, an organization here in Orlando called Hebney Nutrition um, mm. up in New York. They have the City University of New York, uh, the Cooney uh, Food Policy Institute. So they, you know, focus on, you know, um, changing those food policies so that people in these food deserts uh, who historically would have been limited to fast foods have more access to fresh produce. And it kind of goes both ways because the article you shared, they mentioned that, you know, a lot of um, companies will use what they call, I think it's interest-based marketing, meaning if the people aren't interested, we're not going to give it to them. But these private nonprofit organizations are showing if you give these people fresh produce, they're going to eat it. They want mm -hmm. it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this now this question of like, well, what's really the truth, you know? And then the article also mentioned something very interesting is that, you know, as mainstream America rejects certain things like cigarettes, you know, companies will push them marketing wise that Dr. D mentioned a little bit about that marketing. They'll push it more into these low income, you know, neighborhoods. So we really kind of have to get down to the root of the issue. And there's definitely some politics involved. And one of my favorite people, um, scientist, she always says, vote with your fork, you know, with you, what you eat, you know, choose wisely, and then also be involved with those food politics and policies, because even if it doesn't affect you, it may affect the people you care about. And what, what's your thoughts, Dee? Um, and this is another one of my pet peeves. I, I often say um, there are too many um, stakeholders in this country for people to lose weight, to, to, to the incentives for people to lose weight. Too many people are profiting off of people being sick, including myself, and too many people are profiting off of people being obese. For example, um, you know, the fast food places are thriving. Um, uh, the, the um, you know, just let, let's just talk about the wheelchairs have gotten bigger. You know, I was the other day, the, the nurses were running to take somebody out of the, out of the hospital. And it was like they had to go run and get a, a, you know, a big, a big wheelchair, you know, and then, you know, all these big, more stigma monometers, blood pressure cuffs. And, you know, look at all the people. Dialysis units are benefiting because of obesity and the kidney disease that has occurred with that. And the diabetes and the pharmaceutical. Let's not let's not start with the pharmaceutical yeah. companies that are profiting big time. off of people not getting better or well or losing weight. So, I mean. You, you, it gets mind boggling because sometimes it just sort of seems like it's bigger than all of us. And then again, as you, as we were talking earlier, the subliminal messaging that goes around to make us do stuff that causes us not to be healthy or not lose weight. So, you know, I hate to have a nihilistic opinion about everything, <laughs> but sometimes I just throw up my hand and go, it's hopeless. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just it's hopeless, I, you know, but we have to continue to try. We have to continue to, because like I said, from, from where, from in my moccasins, in my moccasins, walking in rooms every day, I just throw up my hands and holler and just say, I've got to try to figure out how to, and I do do a lot of counseling. You know, sometimes when I'm not in a good mood or in a good mood or whatever, I will sit down with somebody and just have a heart to heart talk with them about you know, you might want to think about losing some weight. I mean, sometimes people need to hear these kinds of things. It's like Alcoholic Anonymous, mm -hmm. you know, and people that are overweight, maybe, maybe you know, we need more, you know, we, we talk about Weight Watchers, but more of that, not not fat shaming, but more of that in your face to have you to, to deal with the fact that you have a problem. And let's right. work together to try to fix it. Right. No fat shaming. And so, but um, I think people need to, yes, have an honest conversation with themselves as well. You know, how do you feel? And most people, if they uh, are overweight or have issues that they think is normal, 
when they start eating healthy, getting that energy and that vitality, um, exercising, they go, well, shoot, I feel good. I haven't felt this, this great since so-and-so and so-and-so, you know, when I was in my twenties. And so, yeah, it's important that we start today um, thinking about how we can change our lifestyle with eating healthy and I think it's necessary. But let's talk about, you talk about, uh, Isaac, you talk about nutritional um, self-efficacy. Explain that. Oh, what's that? Absolutely. So I did some research back at Kent State um, where I examined, you know, the food culture and we looked at the history of, you know, food in America, specifically with African-Americans. And, you know, I found that this concept of uh, nutritional self-efficacy was a big predictor of self-rated health. And self-rated health is just asking someone, well, how healthy do you think you are? And as you guys know, I'm sure, you pretty much know what boat you're in. If you say I'm a 10, then you're probably close. If you honestly say you're a, a two and that you're not very healthy, it's usually a very good predictor of health. Um, and nutritional self-efficacy is really just this belief, this feeling that you, know, you can make good decisions. You can create food that you like that's also healthy, which we know is a lot easier said than done. Some people want to eat healthy, but if you throw a bunch of fresh produce on their on their countertop, they might not know what to do with it because they may have grown up in a hamburger helper household, which I always say, you know, I love my parents, but I grew up in a hamburger helper household. We didn't have it every day, but foods like that were very much normal. You know, cutting the fresh vegetables, the, the whole food, and we don't mean the store, right? We just mean whole foods. Um, whole foods weren't, you know, super, common, I guess, in my house. So if you don't come from that, that nutritional self-efficacy could be low. And if I didn't choose to study this, I probably would still kind of be in that, that realm of having low um, nutritional self-efficacy. So it's important. And then too, also, I mean, of course, food that's unhealthy is food that's unhealthy. But when you talk about calorie uh, counts and stuff, you know, back in the day, people were, were more active you know, they were up and out. Remember, we had recess. I mean, I remember recess. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kids don't have recess anymore mm -hmm. or, or very limited. And our parents worked and there was walking and there was a lot of this. There were computers, not sitting in front of computers and all of that. So there was a lot more physical activity for working off calories, um, you know, perhaps early on when people weren't in the hamburger house, the hamburger helper household kind of thing. And then again, like you say, I, who, my parents didn't know anything about that. How, how did they, you know, they didn't know. Um, working, working parents were just trying to put, put whatever food they could on the table and let you get to your homework kind of thing. So, yeah. So we're yeah. a whole new generation now. Right. And what's so cool is that we do have education that's available now. You can you can look up things on on the website. You know, you can always go to VickyDoFitness.com. Right. <laughs> and find that. But eat. What is it? Eatright.org is um, a good place to go because um, that's where all the evidence based nutrition and nutrition as a science. Right. Um, that's where you can find um, uh, good information, but you can also find good information with the American Heart Association. Um, I always tell people to go to Mayo Clinic and just plug in um, Mediterranean diet or DASH diet, and you'd be surprised of all the wonderful um, recipes um, that will come up. And so I think people just, you know, we just have to get in that seeking that learning, that mindset to um, um, be healthy and nutritional self-efficacy. I'm going to start using that because I always- I like about, that. Yeah. You I need always, to patent that. Yes. I always talk about self-efficacy when we talk about, you know, living a healthy lifestyle, you know, knowing and having the confidence that you can do it. So now let's add in that nutrition, you know, knowing that you can cook and um, be able to eat and make those healthy choices when it comes to food. But let's talk about, you know, West African culture. I'm going to talk about that because of my honey sweet, you know, I asked my honey sweet, I said, you know what, 
what are some of the good foods that you ate back home in Africa? And guess what? A lot of greens, cassava, that's almost um, like um, um, potatoes, but a little bit firmer, um, um, tomatoes, um, all of those staple foods, uh, rice. And I know, D, you know about jollof rice. Jollof right? rice. Yes, from my friends in Ghana in the UK. I spent a lot of times with them and eat, you know, plantains and plantains. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Very, so, very healthy, healthy food. Very healthy. So, when we talk about, you know, African Americans and African and, and what we eat, no, we got to get out of that mindset that our food is not the best. No, we got, we have good food. We just have to go back to the basis, right? Go back to basis, go back to what we used to eat and um, start really thinking about that. So there's a, um, a blog that I looked up. It's called wellandgood.com. And I want all of you guys to, to look this up. It says West African foods offer delicious variety and flavor to plant-based eaters and it talks about it talks about you know west africa um and the foods that are brought back from nigeria and and ghana to all the folks that are coming here you know from west africa and bringing that good cuisine with them and you guys know when y'all come to my house we got some spinach stew going on right you know <laughs> absolutely i'm still waiting for my spinach soup i still <laughs> have not had it doctor you've been promising me and pro okay we're gonna after you get your vaccine and I all of that I, I think you have the website on your or the recipe on the website though right i think I, did you share it? No, I haven't shared it. That's that's oh. a secret. I was that's gonna a, say, I, but I have it. <laughs> I have it written to put on the website, but I haven't done it yet. I have to I have to do a big drum roll. Boom! <laughs> We're putting it out on the Vigado <laughs> Fitness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So but I'm looking I'm, forward to that. Yeah, that's when I get my vaccine and then we can breathe on each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But yeah, exactly. I was looking at jollof rice was on here, you know, and you don't have to put the 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 meat. Sometimes we put a little bit of shrimp or chicken. You don't have to do that. You can just have the 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 uh the food itself with a lot of the spices and all of that. And so I and was one of the things that I started doing when I started on this big weight loss, you know, I've been through several having children, you know, everybody when you gain weight when you're pregnant and then you lose weight and so forth. But one of the things recently when I started working with trainers and and nutritionists and so forth and so on is reading labels. I think that's mm -hmm. something important for people to do to realize that you know, I won't name the program, but when you buy you know, you buy this free, these freezer foods that are, you know, touted as being, you know, healthy. And then you turn them over and it's a gram of sodium or 23 grams of carbohydrates that you haven't factored into your whole diet. So, again, like I said, who's who's benefiting? This is something that Dr. Joe and I talk about all the time. Yes, we who's do. Who's benefiting? Mm -hmm. So when you've got something that's touted as a weight loss kind of thing, you need to turn it over and read the actual ingredients that are going into some of these processed foods, which is why the fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff that we're talking about here are, are better. That's yes, so is. important. And, and the, the underlying theme here really, especially as, you know, Dr. Dope parallels, you know, our diet versus the West African diet. Um, is, you know, eating whole foods and eating more natural foods versus, you know, less processed foods. I mean, you know, we have foods that are signature to different regions, but generally speaking, when you do have more processed foods in your diet, you do have more sodium, you do have more refined sugar, refined carbohydrates, you know, um, et cetera. So it really is about investing more in that, you know, whole foods diet. I mean, I always tell people there's just kind of certain rules that if you follow, you'll be good, even when it comes to calorie counting. I just talked about um, methods, you know, earlier of how the methods that we're using currently don't work. I mean, trying to, as, as professionals, yeah, I love to count some calories. I love math. But when you're working with somebody that is an accountant or a teacher, they don't need to or want to know, you, you know, usually about how to count all these calories. But 
realistically, if you ate these foods, these whole foods, you know, more vegetables, vegetables are full of fiber. They're full of water. You mm -hmm. can't, you can't overeat spinach because if you ate too much spinach, you would be full. You know, even when we talk about toxicity, <laughs> exactly. Toxicities, you know, only way you can get vitamin toxicity, generally speaking, is through supplements. If you to get a vitamin K toxicity, you would need to eat like a bathtub full of spinach. And I say that to say, if we just ate our whole natural foods, you know, vegetables, you know, more vegetables especially, but you know, more vegetables, fruit, you know, lean meat the calories would become a, a little bit less relevant because we're not going to have room in our stomach for all those extra calories. Right. Period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you add that, you add that with um, um, exercising every day, doing some strength training. You good to go. That's the combo effect. You good to go. And it's so simple, but the world we live in makes it hard. I mean, it really yeah. is that simple, but when we got the, what the, like you said, we're not going to say the name, but we got the, this, the, that, this company that delivers the food, this convenience, this fast food right around the corner. We're busy, right? Americans. Now we value work more than ever before. We feel guilty when we are off work too long to take vacations. You know, if we spend too much time cooking meal prepping, we feel like we're not productive enough, but it's like, we have to take a step back and reintegrate, you know, regular cooking into our lifestyle. So we can, I'm going to ask you this. We can still do our traditional food and we're finding out that our traditional food, you know, pretty healthy. It's just how we cook mm -hmm. it. Right. And so, and, you know, we always talk about evidence-based, our evidence-based heart healthy diets, such as the DASH diet, the Mediterranean flexitarian, flexitarian diet is where you, you uh, take at least two or three uh, days out of the week, maybe two days out of the week and have one day or two days where you do plant-based eating all day, right? So that's flexitarian, right? That's a flexitarian diet. But even these diets that we talk about, evidence-based heart healthy diets, we still, as African-Americans, we still can hold on to our food culture and still eat healthy. What do you say about that? I can agree. We? Yeah. I think so. Absolutely, Absolutely. we can. Yeah. Absolutely. So I just want to ask you guys, if there's one point that Dr. D made that really, um, I think is very important about how, you know, we have this system, like you said, where if you really think about it, and especially as a practitioner, right, you've seen it, um, thinking about this kind of bigger picture that, like you said, can seem overwhelming. Like we have all these industries, you know, working against us, the marketing. Uh, if you really think about it after, you know, with all your, you both of you, with all your experience and the population that you've worked with, what would you say is a solution for someone navigating that? Because at the end of the day, yeah, we can't change it. You know, I can't snap my fingers and change it, but how do we navigate that to live our best life regardless? Well, you know, we, th that's where education and teaching comes to play because we, we're going to have distractions, right? You know, there's all kinds of distractions for everything, not just for eating healthy or exercising or not exercising. There's always distractions, you know, um, coming at us. That's that environment, right? But um, if we change our mindset, that's why we always, every time, and you know, Isaac, every time I start uh, doing some type of um, weight loss program or any type of um, um, exercise or nutrition program, I spend weeks just talking about behavior change and mindset because once your mind, um, once you change your mind and you make that commitment and then you start going through the behavior change processes uh, or the process to uh, uh, develop these healthy habits, then the eating part, the healthy eating and the exercise and all the things that you need to do for a healthy lifestyle, that will be easy. It's simple. The hardest part is the mindset, making a commitment, changing our mindset, because guess what? When we make up our mind, I don't care what, when we make up mm -hmm. our mind, it's done. It's it comes with a relationship too. You know how we get being, some people be in these toxic relationships, but then one day they wake up and say, you know what? I'm done. 
And Absolutely. once they say that, once they commit it, once that mindset is done, everything else is easy. So I think it's about um, uh, teaching um, all of us. Um, we can teach um, acceptance and mindset. I think that's the very first step um, to get behavior change and the rest will be a lot easier. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I completely agree. Um, it's, but like I said, it, that, that commitment thing is, is a difficult kind of thing. You talk about it, you talk it out, you read about it, but you've got to put it into place. And, but I still come back to, there's just too many stakeholders that are out there that don't want everybody to succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, what happens, too, is um, just, you know, one other one other point is that when you're on this journey and you're, you know, you're changing your lifestyle and you're exercising and you're doing all these nutritional things, not everybody claps for you. Mm. You know, that's another situation you were talking about, you know, eating the light skin food <laughs> and. But, but also what happens, you lose girlfriends and you lose male friends and you lose all these friends because, you know, basically people don't want to see you do well. Mm -hmm. you, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so not everybody claps for people. So you have to, again, stand, stand fast on, you know, just being committed to doing that. Right. Because Absolutely. it's, it's about you, right? Right. It's about you. You know, when you get sick, you get sick, not right. you and somebody else. No, it's you get sick based on, you know, your circumstances. So right. I think, you know, that we should choose being healthy and make that our choice, our personal individualized choice. What do you think, Isaac? I agree. And I will say, you know, it definitely can be alienating in a sense. And I, I think sometimes it is, you know, Dr. D, you said it without saying it, but people be hating. But aside <laughs> from that, <laughs> people do. They do. You know they, they do. They be hating. And aside from that, sometimes it's just about, you know, you're going against what some people perceive as their culture. You know, right. some people do associate these behaviors with, oh, this is this is my culture. This is where I come from. You're going against that. That makes right. me uncomfortable. But what I'll say is that, you know, culture is, is flexible, culture changes, you know, and um, I'm in the business of pushing the black food culture forward, you know, showing, you know, people, students, you know, my clients that, you know, we can create food that is both healthy and delicious. And it's tricky because you can say it, but doing it is, is a different thing. And I will say too, you know, some of the same people that call me rabbits, my dad, now he... <laughs> He loves my food. He loves my food. Yeah. Um, he talks about it. He brags about it. You know, oh, he's telling his friends about how his son does, cooks this and cooks that. And sometimes you just have to show people. It's like once you show right. them, they can't, they can't unsee it. When they realize that you can do both, okay, now it's just about how do I, you know, how do I do it? How do I actually do it? But now mm -hmm. I at least know it's possible. And that's contagious. You know, just like bad habits are contagious, healthy habits are certainly contagious, especially right. if they taste good. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so, guys, this was a great show. And this is the end of our show. But, you it know, at the, great. yeah, at the end of our show, we always have some type of summary that we can leave with folks. So what do you say, Isaac? You go first. You go What's first, a, Isaac. Mm -hmm. I would just say it's possible period. You know, people who say it's not possible, they think you have to choose between healthy and delicious food. You don't have to choose. It's certainly possible. What about you, D? Well, I kind of look at it like this too, you know, in terms of making a commitment and doing your due diligence and all those things in terms of healthy living, people will sit and, and try to figure out what iPhone they're going to get. They'll spend two days looking through stuff, right? They'll spend two days <laughs> looking through catalogs and reading all the updates and consumer uh, stuff to buy an iPhone. They'll go in three or four stores, you know, looking for a television, 60 inch or 75 or whatever. 
why can't you make that same commitment for, but it's whatever you want to do. You know, I'm right. You know, people were like, I want a Samsung or do I want a Verizon? And is it four gigabytes or 10? Or, <laughs> what am I going to, am I right, Isaac? I mean, you're of that millennial era. So they'll spend all that time doing all that research for all of that, but they won't do research to talk about, to figure out about processed foods and, you know, those kinds of things. So it's, it's whatever you want to do. And I think it's, it is doable if you want to do it. If you see it as something that's beneficial, because a lot of times if you're young, you don't see down the line that at age 50, you're going to be on a dialysis machine uh, looking for a transplant or have a woman having heart disease or that necrotizing fasciitis thing that I was telling you guys about because uh, of, of diabetes and, and all of that. So, yeah. Yes. And so, yes, as um, with ending of our show, yes, we want to admonish everyone, you know, especially our African-American community. You know, we always talk about our culture and food and what we should eat. But when we look at it, what we eat, some of our staple foods are the best food, the collard greens, the kale, the yams, you know, and it's about how we cook it. And yes, we can change. We just have to make that effort and make that commitment. You know, it's about changing our mindset. And it is worth it because no one wants to be suffering from all of these chronic diseases, you know, and it just doesn't kill us. Most of the time it doesn't kill us like that. No, it's long. Oh, silent, slow, chronic killers, right. Mm -hmm. Forever and ever mm -hmm. and ever. And so we want to encourage everyone to um, embrace healthy living because you'll just feel better, Right. Yes, you'll feel better. And as always, folks, for more information, make sure you go to our website, vickidofitness.com. And if you have any questions, you know, put them in the comments below. And last but not least, make sure you uh, hit the like button, share this podcast on your social media platform and help us spread the word about living a life of health and fitness, right? And I am Dr. Vicki Haywood Doe and we have Dr. D Banks Bright that was in the house with us. And last but not least, Isaac Floyd. And so you guys, mwah. great to see you, Isaac. It's always good to see you. Yes, yes, yes. We'll have to do this again. We'll have to do a follow up. Yes, we have Absolutely. to do a follow up. All right. Follow up with some food. You said what? You said follow up with some food. We're gonna make yeah. some food next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and speaking of which, we want all of you guys go to um, the website vikidofitness.com forward slash events. And there you will find the uh, list of events that we're having with our Get Back to Healthy series. And one of those, at least two or three of those, we're going to be doing some cooking demos online through Zoom. So you want to sign up because we got Isaac in the house. You know, he's going to put his foot up on in it. <laughs> we're going to do some things for sure. We're going to do sure. some things. That's it. All right now. All right, you guys, take care. Have a good one. You too. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.